Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Osmondson, and I'm welcoming you to our uh, modeling of COVID-19 webinar. Um, we're so excited to be here. I don't think there's been a topic um, that has both prompted so much rapid political change and so much consternation and confusion during the COVID-19 crisis as uh, modeling. We're so happy to have um, Lauren, and Jeffrey here, and I'm going to hand it over to Wafa Alsatter, who is moderating um, today's webinar. Wafa, take it away. And thank you very much, uh, Joe. And uh, I welcome you all as well. I'm Wafa Alsatter, I'm the ICAP Global Director, and uh, very um, honored to uh, co sponsor this webinar this morning uh, with um, the Treatment Action Group tag and the COVID uh, Working Group uh, here in New York. I'm going to very briefly introduce our uh, three speakers and then uh, we'll go through their presentations uh, back to back. Firstly, we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Shaman uh, present and he is a professor of environmental health sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University and he's also the director of the Climate and Health uh, Program. Uh, he has led uh, many uh, highly regarded and efforts uh, in terms of uh, modeling and projections uh, for COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic here in this country. Our second speaker will be Dr. Lauren Ansel Myers, and she is the Cooley Centennial Professor of Integrated Biology and Statistics and Data Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. And she leads an interdisciplinary team of, sci of scientists, engineers, public health experts, uh, in uncovering social biological drivers of epidemics. Um, and she will follow uh, Dr. Shane. Our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Caroline Bucky, and she's Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Associate Director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at the Harvard T.H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. And she has also uh, uh, used um, mathematical models and data science to understand the mechanisms that drive the spread of different infectious disease with a focus on pathogens like malaria and other um, uh, health threats that affect uh, particularly vulnerable populations in low income countries. Uh, without further delay, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Shaman uh, to speak first. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Um... I'm going to actually share the screen on my slides, if that's all right. Yes. And uh, can you all see this? Yes, we can. OK. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, modeling in general and uh, specifically using it in the context of the current uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, I think it's important to understand that models are really simply tools that we use to try to understand our our reality. Uh, we use them to try to represent systems uh, that are, exist around them at a variety of scales um, using the language of math. Um, typically what we're trying to do when we build a model is we're trying to build a simplified construct to represent uh, processes and mechanisms of a particular system. It can be a physical, chemical, biological, social, uh, economic system if you will. We're trying to represent them in order to do a number of things. First and foremost, we want to have insight into that system. We want to better understand it. Uh, secondly, the, the, the mathematical framework allows us to manipulate it. It allows us to try to probe how it works and, and what makes it tick. Um, they're generally simplified constructs, as I said, and as they are not real world settings, we have the opportunity to manipulate them and do a variety of things. So generally, I would say that there are about four different things we try to do with models for infectious diseases specifically. We try to understand the transmission dynamics and other processes that might affect disease incidence. Uh, relatedly, we often use them to try to infer what epidemiological characteristics of the disease are. And in the case of COVID-19, this has been particularly important because it's a newly emergent disease and we really need to understand its properties as we're addressing and confronting it. Uh, the next is that we often can use them because they're uh, an idealized um, framework for actually studying the virus or a, any pathogen in this instance to test interventions to you to uh, engender counterfactual scenarios that allow us to explore possibilities. We can look at things like vaccination campaigns. We can look at other types of more simplistic non-pharmaceutical interventions 
and we could try to quantify what the effects of those interventions might be. And the last, which has certainly gotten a lot of play um, recently, uh, is to look at and uh, project what might happen in the future. And I think projections of the future or predictions in cases where the system is more stationary, um, this has been an, an emergent field in infectious disease over the last decade or so. And, and the aim here is to recognize that, you know, we have information about the past. We have some information about what's going on in the future with an infectious disease. And if we can further enlighten it by providing information about what might happen in the future, we're gonna be able to scope out what are some of the range of possibilities of disease incidents that we're gonna be facing, what are some of the scenarios that might, we might be confronting, and we can better steal or prepare ourselves for those possible eventualities. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some SARS-CoV-2 now, but to do that, I'm actually gonna frame it in the context of a, product, a, pro, ugh, a project that we had going on in New York City. It was a project that we called the Virome of Manhattan, where amongst its aims was one in which we were trying to understand what is the gross prevalence of common respiratory infectious diseases, viruses, uh, in the New York City population. In the United States, uh, as in many parts of the world, we have a passive surveillance system for monitoring uh, respiratory viruses. That is that we wait for people to come in typically seeking clinical care, and if they come into a Sentinel clinic, they can be identified because they'll keep track of the number of patients they see on a daily basis. And they'll also identify people who potentially have respiratory viruses through a, a diagnostic of a, of a syndrome. Basically, we often call it here influenza-like illness defined as a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater, plus a cough or sore throat. It varies around the world precisely what the definition is, but loosely we get this in many countries in the world where they're they're actually monitoring this syndrome that's loosely related to influenza. It can also capture lots of other pathogens. We should also note that some, some places will in fact test for specific pathogens, so you can actually have some sort of virological assay that's providing you additional information about specific pathogens. But in the viral Manhattan, we wanted to see how much of it was out and about in the community. We wanted to get a sense of how much virus is actually out there, how much asymptomatic infection was out there, how much undocumented infection was out there, and how these viruses maintained themselves in the New York City community. And so what we did in one of the arms of this study is we established a cohort. We ultimately had over 200 individuals in it. It ran from October 2016 to April 2018. It concluded daycares, toddlers and their parents, people who worked at the Columbia University Medical Center, uh, some pediatric and adult emergency departments, and a high school. What we asked the participants to do was to provide a daily um, diary or log of their symptoms with respect to cold and flu. So every day over their phone, they would enter into an electronic database on a Likert scale how they were feeling with respect to nine common respiratory symptoms. So things like runny nose, sneezing, cough, sore throat, chills, they would rate none, mild, moderate, or severe for each of them. And this would go directly into an electronic database. It would take them all of 30 seconds. They would also provide on a daily basis three additional pieces of information, which was whether they had um, taken medicine because of their respiratory symptoms, stayed home from work or school, or gone to seek a clinician's uh, services because of their respiratory symptoms. And what you're seeing in this table is an aggregation of the infectious episodes that we documented in this group, because in addition to them providing this daily diary, once a week, we would swab these individuals. We would take a nasal pharyngeal swab, take it back to the lab, run it against a respiratory viral panel for 18 different viruses. What you're seeing are the documentation of the infectious episodes, which are defined as a group of consecutive weekly specimens from a given individual positive for the same virus. We allowed a one week gap in the middle of it so somebody could be positive for virus, not negative the next week, and then positive the third week, and that would be a single episode where we would assume the gap is a false negative or temporary low shedding. Um, what you're seeing is these uh, virus episodes aggregated by virus type broadly. So we see 
influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, parainfluenza, human metanumavirus, rhinovirus, adenovirus, and coronavirus. So for instance, there are four different coronaviruses that were individually tested for, and an episode would have to be a specific coronavirus, but we've aggregated all of them here, and you can see there were 137 endemic coronavirus episodes, 32 flu episodes, et cetera. Now, the box in red is the one that I want you to focus on because MA stands for medical attention. These are episodes during which the individual sought a doctor's attention because of the symptoms associated, uh, well, the respiratory symptoms they experienced during this infection. And what you can see is those numbers are much lower than the episode number. The next column, which shows the probability of seeking medical attention given infection with virus I, shows the conditional probability. What it shows is that only 22% of influenza episodes were associated with somebody seeking medical attention for their cold and flu symptoms. The numbers go down from there. Human metanumavirus, it's only 20%. Coronavirus, it's down to 4%. One in 25 individuals actually sought medical care for their coronavirus infection. And so what we saw from what this was that the vast majority of infections are not documented. Most of them are undocumented and that there's a lot of virus circulating. We could also see that the majority of infections for any of the virus were asymptomatic. Asymptomatic we also could see was a bit of a squirrely definition because what we saw from these continuous time series from all these individuals was that different people had different baseline reportings. There were some individuals who reported symptoms every single day. It didn't matter what was going on, maybe they had chronic rhinitis, maybe they had fibromyalgia, they were always reporting symptoms. So what was asymptomatic for them had to be referred to maybe next to a baseline rather than just saying that, well, they have symptoms, therefore they are symptomatic. So there are lots of definitions of symptomatic versus asymptomatic that can be used. Regardless of what we chose, though, we saw that the majority of infections were asymptomatic. But what was more revealing really was that this documented versus undocumented uh, line was clearer and it was actually perhaps more informative because the undocumented are people who are never gonna get into the system. They're the unknowns. They're the people who have mild enough symptoms that they're still gonna go out and about while they're shedding and contagious. They're gonna do what many of us do when we have a sniffle or a mild sore throat. And that's what nothing, we're just gonna go about our business. We'll still go to work. We'll still get out and about in the community. We'll still do activities. If we have a business trip, we still may get on an airplane. And these viruses can thrive off this. People are transporting them different places. They're geographically translocating them and they're allowing them to move from community to community. So when we saw COVID-19 appear in China in January, which is when we really got wind of it, and we saw how rapidly it moved from its epicenter in Wuhan to other cities in China, and then began hopping on airplanes and moving from China to Thailand and then Japan and South Korea and the US, et cetera, we immediately suspected, given this understanding that we've developed for other respiratory viruses, that this virus may have a lot of undocumented infections. There may be a lot of people who are out and about, who are unaware that they're contagious, who are spreading and dispersing the broad virus broadly and allowing it to move so rapidly from location to location. So we built a model to try to understand this. And the type of model we built is something called the metapopulation model. And this is a, a network model that represents the transmission of the virus, in this case SARS-CoV-2, in 375 cities in China. We link the cities using travel records that are provided by a location-based service. This is Tencent, which has, uh, gets location-based movement off of cell phones from apps such as QQ and WeChat, which have very large penetration in Chinese markets. And we could get this travel data for records during the run-up to the Chunyun Spring Festival. What we do with this model is we're going to couple it with what are called data simulation methods. They're also called Bayesian inference methods or sequential Monte Carlo methods. These are statistical algorithms that allow us to assimilate or ingest data into the model framework and use it to adjust its conditions. What it does is it optimizes the model. It allows us to align, align the model's parameters and variables so that they're, more, they're better able to represent what has actually transpired in the data that's being ingested. It's an optimization and it's a fitting exercise, if you will, of a nonlinear integrator, which is this model on the left there. 
Now we're gonna use daily observations of cases from 375 cities. And we're gonna use it to simulate and assimilate data for a very short period of time, January 10th to January 23rd. We chose this window because before January 10th, observations of COVID-19 infections were rather sparse. And after January 23rd, well, January 23rd is the date on which China imposed lockdown. There was no more travel allowed in and out of Wuhan, and they quickly locked down other cities and uh, imposed other travel restrictions. So this two week window represents the time period, whoops, sorry, during which uh, the virus was moving in its natural state, if you will, in Chinese society. Now within the model, we explicitly represent contagious um, documented infections and undocumented infections separately. So the documented infections are our observations. These are the people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 infections. The undocumented are people whom we want to infer. And what we're going to try to do with this model, which we tested using control data sets to show that it was what's called identifiable, is we're going to try to determine what fraction of infections are documented and what fraction conversely are undocumented. And what is the relative contagiousness of those undocumented infections? Are they part of the transmission cycle? So I'm gonna to cut to the chase here to show you the results that we got here. We had a number of parameters that we were able to identify simultaneously in this large modeled inference framework. And what we found was, and I wanna draw your attention to in particular, the reporting rate alpha. This is this dividing line between those who are documented and those who are not. And it gave us a value of inferred of 0.14. What that means is that it estimated that 14% of infections were documented. And conversely, that 86% were undocumented. The other critical parameter is mu, the relative transmission rate, which came out at 0.55. And this means that per person, undocumented infections were on average half as contagious as documented infections. Now, because it's a a model environment, we could actually play around with it then. We could ask questions like, well, what would happen if these undocumented infections were not contagious? They were not capable of transmitting it. Would you see the same characteristics of the outbreak? Would you have the same number of infections? When we do simulations where we withhold mu, we set it to zero, we find that without transmission from these undocumented cases, almost 80% of confirmed cases disappear. And so what it indicated to us was that the undocumented infections, even though they're only half as contagious per person, because there's so many more of them, they are responsible for the lion's share of transmission of this virus. They are the ones who allow it to spread, very often unwittingly, from people shedding the virus who don't know it to others in their community. They are the ones who allow it to go from location to location because these are the people who are still ambulatory, that are still shedding the virus. Now, whether they're asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, or even pre-symptomatically shedding, which we also saw evidence for, is not really something that we're gonna be able to tease apart in great detail. The dividing line we chose to look at was documented versus undocumented, which aligns with what we see and what we don't. Now, we took this same model and we rejiggered it and applied it to the United States. Instead of applying it to cities, we applied it to every county in the United States. In the US, there are 3,000 plus counties, so each one of them has its own transmission dynamics that are linked by movement data that we can get both from location-based service data and Census Bureau records. And we did a similar inference problem of the initial outbreak in the US through March 13th. And you'll notice that the parameters were getting very similar, and particularly the latency period and the infectious period of the virus wound up being very similar between China and the US, which is good because we expect that to be the case. The basic reproductive number is roughly the same as well, went from 2.38 to 2.27. However, there's a shift in the reporting rate for the US. It dropped from 0.14, which is one in seven persons being documented who are infected, to 0.08, meaning only one in 12 infections are a documented case. This is in line with the difference in the US is testing policies in the initial portion of the outbreak and the shortage of test kits that were available. They were somewhat restricted in use. Consequently, because we're documenting less of the more severe infections, the relative transmission rate popped up a bit, which is also not unsurprising. So we've used this model to make inferences in both China and the US. And we also have taken it and used it to generate projections. These are projections that we generated on March 15th or 16th. It's three months later now, and here we are almost to June 20th, and you're seeing indeed what we projected back then. 
Now, these were highly idealized projections. We took the model, we had a single fitting of parameters for the whole US, which claims that transmission in a densely populated urban environment is going to be the same as a very rural, sparsely populated county, which we know is not the case. But we're using these as projections, not predictions, to try to suss out what levels of control might be needed to actually control this virus. So what you're seeing is a single snapshot on a single day, just on June 20th. It's not an accumulative number of cases. It's just showing you the instantaneous number. And what you see is that when there's no control, we expected the whole United States to be saturated. There to be infections everywhere. And as a matter of fact, in places like Seattle and New York, we were expecting without control, it was already well past peak. And that's why you don't see as dark colors there. On the upper right, we said, well, what if we impose a 25% reduction? So all the non-pharmaceutical interventions we impose, the, the uh, face mask wearing, social distancing, shuttering of businesses and, and schools, these are gonna have effects that will reduce the contact and the opportunities for transmission between people. What happens then? And what you can see is that the virus doesn't make quite as much progress into the middle of the country in that simulation. When we make a 50% reduction, there's an even more marked reduction. And there are lots of places in the country that are not yet affected, according to this simulation. We also tried one where we cut off movement between counties, but you have to do that at a very high level if you're really going to restrict um, the virus from spread. So what this shows really is what are the level of intervention that is needed to impact this virus? That's what this is showing. It's not supposed to be a specific prediction, but it's scoping out possible outcomes given scenarios of certain levels of intervention. Now, in the intervening time after that, we started to make the model more complex. We began to ingest not just case data, but also death data. Um, we um, also allowed variability from county to county. So the different counties would have different reproductive numbers ultimately because they would have different constituent parameters that will allow for that different design. So we're allowing this, ident this variability to come in. It actually results in a, a compromising because the model becomes a lot more complex or higher dimensional, that it becomes more difficult to make accurate estimates of all the parameters. We try to keep it simplistic, but we want to see what this variability is. So we're ac accepting some level of error in order to get some insight into the heterogeneity in transmission in the United States. One of the things we did was as May 2nd, as this country was reopening, there were about 25 states that had just had or were planning to reopen, and these are the ones shown here, we could make estimates of what the effective reproductive number was on a county by county in these reopening states. And the point here was to see whether or not the reproductive number fell above or below one. If it's above one, we expect the outbreak to be growing. If it is below one, we expect the outbreak to diminish. What we would hope is that the counties that were reopening would be in a position of strength where their counties would all be below the one line. As you can see, that's not the case. Many of the states that are reopening are straddling this R equals one line, this magic line that we want to be below. And some of them are predominantly above the line, such as Ohio. And that's concerning because what we want is we want this virus to be well quashed down. We not only want there to be a low number of cases, we want the R, that reproductive number, driven well below one before we actually consider reopening and loosening restrictions, opening businesses, allowing people to mingle more, and potentially providing more opportunities for transmission of the virus. That would give us the wiggle room that if the reproductive number rises a bit, it still might not get above one, and we still might, and we thus might not have flare-ups of the virus. So when we made projections back then, we had to impose scenarios again. And our scenarios changed as well. So typically when you're making a projection, you have the uncertainty of the model, which is simplified representation of reality. And you also have a fitting of it, which has its own error. But in this case, we have to assume what society will do. What is going to happen on a county by county basis? How will they respond to the virus over the next four or six weeks? What will they do to control it? Will they wear face masks? At what level? What's the compliance? What's the social distancing? The reality is, of course, we don't know what that's going to be. So we have to use different scenarios to scope out what some of the outcomes are. And what you're seeing here is some of the, the dots are showing you observations. These are projections we made back on May 7th, and it's showing you how well we did up to the beginning of June. 
And right now what it shows is that some of our middle of the road scenarios, not the most conservative and not the most aggressive, were more in line with what was going on. We've also done something where we've done an inference and fitting of the model. Jeff, uh, if you can please um, try to finish uh, in two minutes. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. So we've also done an inference and fitting of the model where we've actually fit the model broadly and looked at the reproductive number grossly. And we've then done some counterfactuals, which is one of the other things I said we can do with these models. And this included looking at what would have happened in the United States had we peeled back our control efforts earlier. So that I just wanted to give you a little taste of some of the things we can do with the models. We can generate projections, we can do inference, we can understand some of the epidemiological properties. My apologies for going a little long there. I'll stop there, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and I'm sure you generate a lot of questions uh, uh, from the audience, and I remind everyone to please uh, enter your questions in the Q&A. Uh, let's move on to uh, this, our second presentation. Please go ahead, Dr. Myers. Good morning, everybody. Um, in addition to um, being a professor at UT, I'm also the director of the University of Texas's new COVID-19 modeling consortium. We have a website that includes forecasts of uh, COVID deaths, and a number of publications of some of the work I'm gonna talk about today. I was asked to come today to speak about um, how influenza models modeling informs our understanding and modeling of COVID, but it's going to be a bit of a bait and switch. I am going to talk for a moment about influenza, but I'm really gonna spend most of my time talking about COVID modeling. Um, and, and the reason is that pretty much everything we do with COVID, rests on decades of work and understanding that we've gleaned from modeling influenza. What you see here on your screen is a video of a simulation tool that we built for the state of Texas in the aftermath of the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. It is part of a modeling toolkit, a decision support toolkit that was meant to help Texas plan for the next pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the kinds of tools that we developed back in the, the early 2010s help Texas think about how many ventilators will they need to have on hand in central stockpiles and prepositioned in hospitals for the next major threat? When should they close schools and for how long? Uh, what pharmacy and pharmacy chains should they use to distribute strategic national stockpile antivirals? Uh, what you see in this um, tool, which allows them to simulate different scenarios and look at the impacts of different interventions, you see on this map, this map doesn't look fully colored. That's because this tool is also teaching the user to know what they're gonna see through the lens of an imperfect surveillance system. So what if you have crappy testing data, you don't know what's really going on, how can you still make good decisions? So we have been thinking about scenarios like this, mostly in the context of flu for a long time. Um, because of the work that we've done in Texas and elsewhere, we were one of five different groups, including Dr. Shaman's group, that's been part of a CDC project to build a national modeling resource for pandemics. The project is called, called Flu Code. Uh, it started not even a year ago, and most of us were about maybe 75%, 80% through developing a national scale models of pandemic transmission when COVID-19 uh, started uh, emerging out of China. And we and other groups very quickly adapted, recalibrated, restructured our models that had been primarily developed for flu in order to understand, project, and provide decision support for COVID-19. So Jeff and I did not talk before this, um, before this presentation, but I'm gonna mention three key questions that we use our models to address that are gonna sound very much like Jeff's first four use cases. So the first type of question we use our models to address, and these are questions we've learned how to ask and learned how to an answer in the context of thinking through influenza pandemics. The first is when and how is the virus spreading today? Where will the virus be spreading tomorrow or in the next month or sometime into the future? And how can we use our limited public health resources? How can we use costly measures to slow spread and save lives? The way I like to categorize these are as modeling to gain situational awareness. So this is sort of uh, Dr. Shaman's first two, two buckets. Modeling for forecasting, for projecting what's going to happen and modeling for mitigation to support public health um, officials, decision makers in deciding and figuring out how to navigate in, in the case of COVID, the really uncertain and stressful weeks and months ahead. 
I'm gonna give you very brief examples from each of these three categories of work that's being done in the UT COVID-19 modeling consortium. So situational awareness, this is, we're doing this uh, ongoing, but really this is where most of our activity was in the first few weeks after we, we heard about this anomalous virus in Wuhan, China. We scrambled to get our hands on whatever ever data were available, and we built models uh, in order to interpret that data. Um, Jeff had a really nice way of saying it, but basically you can't make sense of data unless you have a model not only of how the virus spreads, but also of your observational process. How are those data being collected? What sorts of biases might be in the data? Where are we seeing disease and where are we not seeing disease? Is it because we're just not looking? So here are some of the kinds of questions that we used models to answer. How fast was it spreading in Wuhan and how fast was it going to spread outside of Wuhan? And our early modeling efforts using um, cell phone mobility data from millions of people around China, using uh, international air travel, using the date and location of the first 20 cases that arrived in cities outside of China, including Bangkok and Seattle and Chicago, led us to estimate that by the time of the Wuhan lockdown on January 23rd, when China reported that there had only been 425 confirmed cases, there were probably around 12,000 confirmed cases. We also use models to think about the person-to-person -person transmission. At the time, well, if, I don't know if you recall this, but in the very first few days, we were told that this virus doesn't even spread from person to person. And then we said, oh, there's limited, we learned there was limited household transmission. And then we very quickly realized this disease was spreading very quickly. Well, our first, our initial assumptions were that this might look like SARS-1, and it might take a good week between somebody becoming infected and being able to infect someone else. But in fact, what we learned early on was that this virus was spreading at about twice the speed of SARS-1. So this is a histogram showing the distribution of serial intervals. This is basically a serial interval is the time if person A infects person B, it's the time between person A having first feeling symptoms and person B first feeling symptoms. And what our modeling and our data analysis told us is that this virus was spreading fast, an average serial interval of about four or five days, that this virus was spreading silently in some cases. Those negative intervals mean that person B actually started feeling sick before person A. So that means that person A was contagious before they ever felt sick. And this has now been borne out uh, in many other studies, but this was a study that we did uh, in the early days of February with data that was scraped from Chinese language public health websites. And then we also realized that occasionally it takes a long time for a person A to infect person B, meaning that we, we may have to isolate or quarantine infectious people for quite a while to ensure they're not still contagious. We also looked at data from 58 different cities in China to ask what does the timing of action, does the timing of social distancing actually make a difference? So we got the kind of data you see on your screen from 58 different cities. The top graph are case counts. The colors represent imported versus locally transmitted cases. The bottom graph represents our estimate for how quickly the virus is spreading. This is the reproduction number. And importantly, there's this horizontal line at the reproduction number equal one. When that, when that reproduction number falls below one, we expect that the virus will, will, will sort of wear itself out. We've brought the virus under control. So the question we looked at was how long between the first intervention in the city and that city actually get, getting control over the outbreak in the city. And we found, looking across all these cities, that a one day delay in intervention translated to an extra two and a half days of having to fight the outbreak. Two and a half days of costly interventions before the virus was brought under control. And this has implications for today as, we're, as we look ahead to maybe weeks or months of battling resurgences in the virus. What this tells us perhaps is that a one week delay in taking action might mean we may need to be sheltering in place for another two and a half weeks. So turning to the second prong, forecasting, where will it be spreading in the future? And as Jeff mentioned, this is the sexiest area. This is the area that's getting the most attention by policymakers, the press, et cetera. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention because of the IHME model, which probably many of you are familiar with. If not, I'll leave it to you to, to look up the details. But this is one of the first models that was cited widely uh, by policymakers to motivate decisions they were making. Um, it forecasts, in addition to um, hospital surges, it also forecasts deaths. It came under a lot of criticism by the modeling community. Um, they have actually updated the model uh, in very significant respects several times to, uh, to make it more predictive, to correct potential issues with it. Um, and this is just a graph showing uh, the mismatch between 
uh, some of their early predictions and what actually transpired. For example, in Spain, this is a back cast. Um, our, our group has also built forecasting models. The first model we built was a variation on the IHME model that was meant to correct a statistical error, but more importantly, um, use, it was the first to use local geolocation data from cell phone uh, geotraces to actually estimate locally on the ground at a census track level, how much were people actually social distancing. What you see on the left is a screenshot of our forecasting model. Um, and what you see on the right is some of the data that fed our predictions. These are uh, cell phone traces for Texas and Dash and Austin, Texas and in, in, in solid, but we have these for every city and state around the country. What you see in the top graph is the amount of people that are staying at home decreased precipitously. Uh, I'm sorry, increased precipitously at the point of the stay home order and decreased as of May 1st as things started to relax. And the number of trips people take to places like bars and hospitals and parks decreased during stay at home and then increased starting on May 1st. We have since replaced our IHME-like model with a, a model that actually includes the transmission dynamics and SEIR model of disease transmission in our forecasting model. I'm gonna pivot, oh, I'll mention that our model along with I believe some of Dr. Shaman's models and now it looks like almost a dozen models are part of the CDC's ensemble, forecasting ensemble. If you go to the CDC's website, you can see what our model and many other models are suggesting with respect to deaths in the weeks ahead. Um, and this is really the way we should be doing modeling. This is the way weather is, is forecasted, not looking at one model, but looking at a, a suite of different models that make different assumptions, have different expertise baked into them. So finally, I'll turn to the, the major focus of our efforts where we spend um, most of our time these days and where you know, arguably modeling is going to have the biggest impact in the coming weeks. And that is modeling to support mitigation. Uh, this is what Dr. Shaman talked about in terms of counterfactual analysis. So let me talk about one particular area that we are doing a lot of modeling, and this is to help support local decision makers in understanding how reopening might play out and specifically what data they should track to do real-time risk assessment of you know, how much transmission is happening on the ground and when the data tells them that they need to trigger a change in policy, that they need to trigger either a relaxation or, or a tightening of restrictions. So this is analysis I'm showing you for, for Austin, but our, our models can do this for any city around the country. So first, here's some graphs just showing how reopening may play out depending on how people behave. So suppose that after May 1st, when Texas started relaxing its orders, transmission rebounded by about 50% relative to the depths of the stay home period. So we really stopped transmission. We estimate that in Austin and many cities, we reduced transmission by probably 70 to 95%. Um, but suppose it rebounds by about 50%. This is what we would, we would pro project will happen in terms of hospitalizations due to COVID in the coming months in Austin, a city, it's a metropolitan area of about 2.2 million people. It's the fastest growing large city in the country. That horizontal line is the estimated comfortable hospital surge capacity for the metro area. And we project that um, by late summer, we will exceed capacity if nothing is done and it will stay above capacity for many months. Um, and we will, we'd expect far more than the 3,500 deaths we expect, uh, we project just from COVID alone, be far more because of the excess morbidity and mortality when we don't have enough uh, beds and, um, and personnel to treat our cases. This is just a zoom in of the lower left showing that this uh, model was fit to the local hospitalization, those red dots, the hospitalization data in Austin uh, up to mid-May. Um, so this is the projection, and you can see that mini, that mini curve back in, in March and April was where we, we sort of brought things under control, but then we started to relax before we really fully mitigated the transmission locally. This is what we would project would happen if we relax, we don't relax quite as much. Transmission only increases by 25%, and maybe that's because people are being more cautious about wearing face masks and keeping their distance. Maybe that's because we're doing a better job of testing, tracing, and isolation to contain clusters. Whatever the reason, if we're able to manage transmission so that it only increases by 25%, we, we expect to see a much more flattened curve that doesn't exceed capacity until maybe uh, late in 2020, and maybe we can handle that surge with enough advance warning, and we anticipate about 2,100 deaths for the metro area over the, over the entire 18-month horizon. Now, on the flip side, if transmission really gets out of hand, if it doubles relative to the stay-home period, which is still far below 
the, the native R0 if we don't do anything, uh, we would expect a catastrophic surge in far more deaths. So what are we gonna do about this? The, the city and, and most cities and most states really want to avoid ever having a surge that exceeds local capacity. And they also want to minimize the, uh, the amount of time we're under restrictive stay home and other social distancing measures. So we, we've done what we call optimization analysis, where we try to find policies that explicitly try to satisfy goals. And what are the goals? We want to avoid overwhelming hospital surges, number one, and we want to avoid long lasting stay home orders, number two. So how do we approach this? Well, we've, we've developed a policy with the city of Austin where they use, instead of having to use just a hammer, they don't need to just throw on the brakes with a stay home at, uh, order, multiple stages of risk that allow them to tap on the brakes with slight restrictions and slight relaxations of current orders. What to track, we help them understand that, and when to trigger. And so this is the, this is the policy recommendation that has been, uh, that we developed over the last couple of months using modeling with the city of Austin that has all actually gone into place in the city of Austin and is guiding policy as we speak. So what to track is the seven day average daily COVID-9 hospital admissions. It's a, it's a long story, but we believe it is the best indicator of, emer of imminent surges and recent increases in transmission, far more reliable and timely than all the alternatives, including case counts and death counts and total heads and beds. Based on this, we have come up with a strategy where there are five different stages, each with different levels of restrictions for low risk and high risk populations, each with clear thresholds that when the seven day average crosses one, you move from stage to one to stage two, crosses five, you move from stage two to stage three, crosses 20, stage three to stage four. And if it ever gets to the point where we exceed 70 uh, daily hospital admissions for COVID on a seven day running average, we, um, we go into, unfortunately, a, a pretty full-fledged shelter in place. This is a projection of what will happen if indeed uh, Austin continues to follow this policy and then when it makes changes, the Austin population actually adheres to the recommendations. What you're seeing is one projection of many plausible projections for the next uh, 18 months. Yellow is sort of that middle, that's that sort of middle level, level three where we are today. Orange means we have to get a little stricter. Uh, red means we actually have to go into a stay home order. So this is what we project might happen. We're gonna actually have to be pretty strict for a while. We may have to go into about a one month shelter in place order around the time schools open, are scheduled to open, which means schools would have to be delayed. If schools do open, they'd have to be open in a very restricted fashion where we are ensuring we're still really limiting transmission. And then maybe by uh, mid 2021, we achieved herd immunity for the most part in Austin and we can become more relaxed. Uh, Lauren, if you can please wrap up. Thank you. I, okay, yes. And indeed the, so this is, this policy is in place in Austin um, by policy in place, meaning the city policymakers have shared it and really tried to socialize it with our community. So they understand what these levels are, including <coughs> including an online dashboard that shows us where we are. Unfortunately, three days ago, we crossed from yellow to orange and the city has gone out there and really tried to message that we need to be more cautious. We need to reduce our capacities in restaurants. We can't, um, the city, city uh, leaders are not able to enforce it because of state level restrictions. However, they're doing their best to get people to behave accordingly. And I'll just say we're, we're basically done the same kind of analysis for Houston and helping them to think through how to implement it in, in, a, in what's the fourth largest city in the country. Um, with that, I'll, I'll acknowledge that this is, uh, everything I've talked about have been the work of dozens of people working around the clock from many different disciplines um, that are all part of the COVID-19 uh, modeling consortium at UT. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Jeff and Lauren, for um, excellent presentations. And you've generated a lot of questions. Uh, and I'm going to try to go through the questions quickly. And also, if we can uh, get as brief as possible answers so we can uh, uh, answer uh, as many of them as possible. Uh, so the first question is uh, quickly for both of you, actually, is um, obviously these models require having a lot of data. And uh, maybe maybe first for Jeff and then for Lauren, what, what can you think of data points that you wish you had um, that would really inform the models and, and make them much better at, at, at all the projections and so on? Uh, what kind of data 
would do you wish you had that you would that we don't have now? Maybe I'll start with you, Jeff, uh, if you can uh, respond. Well, you know, uh, it would be hard not to make the wish list large, but I think I think there is a lot of data that I would love to know about some of the microscale processes in greater detail. Uh, this comes down to what are the settings in which transmission is more likely. Uh, what is the rates of use of face masks? How effective are they mm -hmm. at controlling the dissemination of virion-filled droplets and preventing uh, transmission? Uh, understanding the real effects of, of, of some of the different interventions, but particularly one I'm curious about is face masks and what is the prevalence of use? What has it been? Mm -hmm. and what are the trends might really help us uh, going forward, I think. And what about for you, Lauren? Yeah, I completely agree with, with Jeff. And, and I'll say also, you know, given the disproportionate burden in at-risk communities and Black communities and Latinx communities, um, I think we, you know, in, the, in the, the flu modeling work we've done up to now, we've paid a lot of attention to the distributions at a very microscopic scale of, of individuals with high-risk comorbidities, but we really haven't paid attention much to these other these other issues that put some of our communities at very high risk, not only for infection, but for severe outcomes. And I think we have a real uh, dearth of data that, that um, is, has life-saving, I mean, or actually life-costing implications. And actually building on your response, uh, Lauren, there was a question exactly about the issue of, uh, I mean, a lot of the modeling has focused on cities or counties or countries, but has not, uh, is there value in, in doing more of uh, projections uh, for specific subgroups of the population, whether it be uh, as defined by race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic level, um, age or comorbidities and so on? Um. Uh, yes, absolutely. But I, but I, I think we have to look at these as, you know, connected, connected systems. It, mm -hmm. There is, there's often, you know, cause to look at a single, you know, school or a single facility, but really to understand um, the dynamics of disease, the dynamics of burden, we really have to look at these sub communities in detail, but as connected uh, to larger populations in which they sit. Um, and yes, and there's, there is a real need. And for example, one of the studies that we did early on to support decision making in Austin was to look at the potential risks of uh, allowing construction work. And what our early analysis and, and the way we approached that was by building a model that showed how construction work might amplify transmission within that workforce, but also how it connected to the larger urban community. And, and our projections suggested that allowing uh, construction work to proceed without trying to do um, work site in, impose worksite measures that protect the health and safety of workers would, would dramatically increase risk in that workforce, but also increase risk and undermine mitigation in the, in the city at large. And in fact, what we're seeing in Austin from recent hospitalization data is we see, we, we see tremendous bursts in transmission within the construction workforce, and they seem to be mm -hmm. at a four or five times higher likelihood of ending up in the hospital with COVID than, than other mm -hmm. people from the age group. Thank you. Uh, another question is, um, is an interesting question about um, whether you have mobility data based on being documented versus undocumented. And how did you model that? That's, I guess, Jeff, uh, did you assume that people who were documented uh, were, um, had, were less um, mobile than people who were yeah. undocumented? Yeah, yes, we did, as a matter of fact. In, 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 in the model in China, we assumed uh, that movement between cities was constrained to undocumented people during the infectious period, which is, which is a simplification, of course, because some of those people uh, who are documented may have been quite mobile. Uh, and there are some people who are undocumented who may have stayed at home because of their symptoms. Um, but, but we have to make an assumption like that, yes. Okay, and another question for you, Jeff, is in your model of 95% restrictions, uh, that darker green uh, line um, showed more cases than the 50% restrictions. What, why would that be? Well, those are different restrictions. So the 50% restrictions was a, a reduction of the transmissibility that would be due to shelter in place orders, social distancing, mask wearing. The 95% reduction was only preventing movement between counties. So it was saying we're not going to allow people to move between locations. So there were different interventions. And the point is that uh, restrictions of movement, such as, you know, stopping flights into a particular country, um, are really only thought to be effective if they're really ratcheted up and done very well, if they're fairly tight in the seal 
and preventing leakage of people from coming in. And that was consistent with what we saw between counties within the United States as well. Great. Another question is, um, is has anyone uh, modeled the proportion of cases uh, reporting in the US in the last few months? Are we increasing case capture uh, due to this late increase in testing? Or are we still doing just as poorly as we did earlier on? Um, uh, we have done that. We have performed inference on that. And we do see a rise over the last, since, since the end of April, um, since about April 20th, we've mm -hmm. seen a continual rise. Uh, I think it's very heterogeneous, though, because if you look at the data, there hasn't been an increase in testing in many states. California has had an enormous increase in testing, whereas places like um, where Lauren is in Texas and Alabama and Florida that have seen recent surges, there hasn't been that much increase in testing over the last month. And so I'll, Lauren, let me just, you can comment? Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, add on to that. So, you know what? Um, this is an anecdotal. This is for Austin, where we are we are really making you know daily estimates of the situation on the ground. But what we've seen in Austin, which may be typical of cities in in the South that are seeing resurgences, is, is that they they have ramped up testing quite a bit, and we saw a dramatic increase in our daily estimates of uh, proportions of test proportion of positive of cases tested, um, and it it rose depending on whether you're talking about total infection or you're just talking about symptomatic infection, let's just talk about symptomatic infection, it was from you know, below 10% of cases detected in mid-March up to over 40% um, in, in late May, but we have seen a precipitous decline in the last few weeks. And that's not because we're testing fewer, it's just because we have the same capacity and we have far more people becoming infected. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question that's on everybody's mind is, of course, um, uh, the impact of the, uh, the protests uh, concerning Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, uh, what do you think, how do you think this will impact on um, transmission of the virus and um, trajectory of the epidemic? So we, we've done some modeling of this. I didn't present this, but we, we've been doing a lot of modeling in New York City with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the mayor's office. Uh, where we just use a, a separately built model that, uh, to project what's going on and do a lot of the, the sort of optimization work that, that Lauren showed for Austin that's, that's really wonderful. Um, we did do simulations of what the protests might be. There's, it's really wrought with a lot of uncertainty uh, because the protests are outdoors where you're in open air circulation. Uh, many of them are in the daytime when they're exposed to UV radiation, which also may be detrimental or inhibitory of viral transmission. And it's hard to know how much face mask wearing there is, how much social mm -hmm. distancing is, if they're really being crowded. So boil that all down, it's hard to know if the, the, the demonstrations are providing more opportunities for transmission of the virus, and if so, how much. So what we had to do is we had to scope out a range of pro possibilities again, where we said, these are where we think all the other conditions are, and these are what we think the combined effects of it being outside, it being sunny at times, uh, different rates of face mask usage, et cetera. What we saw was that if we were to take the attack that um, the, the, the protests were engendering more infections at a, a reasonably aggressive rate, the data don't back it. We should have already seen increases in cases in New York City, and we haven't. So what it suggests is that the two more conservative uh, projections that we made, one where there is a fairly substantial uh, ameliorating, ameliorating effect of being outdoors and there's mass usage, et cetera, uh, or the even more stringent one are the ones that are following. So as of yet, in New York City at least, we have not seen a bump associated with the demonstrations. And we have to remember that this is, of course, overlain on all these other loosening of restrictions and reopenings that are taking place. Some places are opening daycares, bars and restaurants are open. So there are a lot of competing signals here that actually might be engendering opportunities for viral transmission. Great, thank you. And maybe a last question uh, as we're running out of time, unfortunately, uh, I'll, I'll throw the question at both of you is, uh, you've shared with us, of course, the value of modeling, particularly in the context of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 and uh, other infectious disease. What are the main, if you can think of the, the, the main limitations when people are looking at uh, or reading about findings from modeling, what is the, what are the main uh, one, the one limitation that you'd like to highlight for 
uh, the audience. I'll start with you first, Lauren. Um, uh, there's, it's a good question. So I think the, the, the biggest thing to keep in mind, particularly since most of the modeling that reaches the public are these long-term forecasts, is that, you know, unlike, unlike weather forecasting, which I, <laughs> Dr. Shaman can talk a lot, a lot about, you know, when you, when you forecast a hurricane, there is nothing we can do to change the path of the hurricane, right? When we mm -hmm. forecast an imminent surge in hospitalizations or deaths, there are a lot of things that we can do on the ground to change that fate. And sometimes we're actually making those forecasts with the hope that things change and that they break our forecasts, they render them wrong. So when you look at these long-term forecasts, you have to realize that the, when we're forecasting disease spread, there's two key inputs. One is how that what that virus is gonna do, how it spreads, but the other is, is people's behavior mm -hmm. and, and policies that govern that behavior. And we just don't have a crystal ball for what policies are coming down the pike and how much people are gonna adhere and what sorts of things they're gonna do voluntarily. And so, you, when you're looking at forecasts, if you're looking beyond, let's say, three weeks, you really have to think of those not as forecasts, but as plausible futures that depend on what we do. And so keeping that in mind, the uncertainty, when you see those error bars, the uncertainty, some of it comes from inherent uncertainty of what we do understand, what we don't understand. But a huge part of that is when we look in the future, is just we don't know what people are going to do in the coming weeks and coming months. Thank you. And from your end, Jeff, if you can think of one thing people should keep in mind. Oh, I was going to echo what Lauren had to say and say that uh, that those those issues are spot on. Um, but al also to, to say that, you know, you could then shoot back and say, well, why are you doing it? If you can't give me a number, why bother doing it? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the reason is that we need to scope out what possible outcomes may lie ahead. We need to get a sense of what the future may hold. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think we have to remember that the models are limited by our simplifications of them, by the data that we have available, and by our uncertainty in the case of the projections of what people will do in the future. However, they do scope out possibilities as best as we can understand them given those limited suite of tools and these limitations that we discussed. And it's important to have some insight into what may happen in the future as you're preparing for it, and that it has to be used as a tool in our arsenal, but not the only one. Well, thank you very much. And certainly I remember the term uh, plausible future, uh, as well as the, the need to do modeling uh, to, inform, uh, to inform action. I want to thank uh, Jeff and Lauren uh, for your excellent presentations and uh, for the discussion. And Dr. Bucky sends her regrets. She was unable to join us today. I want to thank all of you, our audience, for joining us and uh, invite you to uh, please join us again at our next uh, webinar. Thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.